Hello everyone. Today we will start with a new chapter that is on stomach and duodenum. So the function of the stomach is to act as a reservoir for ingested food. It also serves to break down foodstuffs mechanically and commence the process of digestion before these products are passed into the duodenum. So coming to the gross anatomy of the duodenum. So here we can see this is the stoma. So it has a fundus, it has a body, it has a pyloric antrum and this is the pylorus and if you go beyond pylorus we will get a duodenum. And two important landmarks we have the lesser curvature of the stoma and this is the greater curvature of the stoma. So from the lesser curvature of the stoma the uh, lesser momentum arises, which uh, <coughs> is a, a double layer of peritoneum that extends from the liver to the lesser curvature of the stomach, then that is known as the hepatogastric uh, ligament, and uh, from liver to the uh, first part of the duodenum, it is known as hepatoduodenal ligament. So, next we have the greater curvature, and from greater curvature arises the uh, greater momentum. So, greater momentum is a large apron like fold of uh, visceral peritoneum uh, that hangs down from the stomach. It extends from the greater curvature of the stomach, passing in front uh, of the small uh, intestine, and doubles back to ascend to the uh, transverse colon before reaching the posterior abdominal wall. So, these are the uh, important attachment of the uh, greater curvature. So, coming to the uh, blood supply, so the celiac artery provides most of the blood supply to the stomach. So, this picture here we can see this is the lesser sac. So, we go into the lesser sac, this is the posterior surface of the uh, stomach. And so we reach this uh, space surgically by dividing the omentum, greater omentum, which is uh, between the stomach and the transverse colon. So we transact that portion, and after transaction, we reach this area. So here we can see this is the aorta, abdominal aorta, and from here the celiac artery or the celiac trunk arises, which give rise to mainly three branches. We have this is the left gastric left gastric uh, artery, this is splenic artery and this is the common hepatic artery. So, this celiac trunk or celiac artery is the main blood supply to the stomach. So, there are four main arteries, the left and the right gastric artery which runs along the lesser curvature and the left and the right gastroepiploic artery which run along the greater curvature. In addition to this, a substantial quantity of blood may be supplied to the proximal stomach by the inferior phrenic artery and by the short gastric arteries from the spleen. The largest artery to the stomach is the left gastric artery and about 15 to 20 percent of the aberrant left hepatic artery originates from it. Consequently, proximal ligation of the left gastric artery occasionally result in acute left-sided hepatic ischemia. The right gastric artery, it arises from the hepatic artery or the gastroduodenal artery. The left gastroepiploic uh, artery originates from the uh, splenic artery and the right gastroepiploic artery originates from the gastroduodenal artery. So, here we can see this is the lesser curvature, this is the greater curvature. So, here it is the area which is supplied by the left gastric and this is the area which is supplied by the right gastric artery. So, there is an anastomotic arcade between the left gastric as well as the right gastric artery uh, over the lesser curvature. Similarly, here in the greater curvature, we have left gastroepiploic artery and this is the 
right gastroepiploic artery. So this right gastroepiploic artery is arising from the gastroduodenal artery and here it is arising from the splenic artery. So they form an anastomotic, anastomotic network uh, over the greater curvature of the uh, stomach. And this part, the proximal as well as this funnel part is supplied by the uh, short uh, gastric arteries or sometimes inferior phrenic artery. The extensive anastomotic connection between these major vessels ensures that in most cases the stomach will survive if three out of four arteries are ligated provided that the arcade along the lesser and the greater curvature are not disturbed. If the arcade is maintained, then only one artery is uh, sufficient for complete uh, supply to the stomach. In general, the veins of the stomach runs parallel to the artery. The left gastric vein or the coronary vein and the right gastric vein usually drains into the portal vein. The right uh, gastroepiploic vein drains into the superior mesenteric vein and the left gastroepiploic vein drains into the splenic vein. On the lesser curvature, the left gastric or the coronary vein is particularly important. It runs up the lesser curvature towards the esophagus and then passes left to right to join the portal vein. Coming to the lymphatic drainage, the lymphatic drainage of the stomach parallels the vasculature and drains into four zones of lymph nodes. So here we can see four zones. We have the superior gastric node of uh, uh, lymph nodes. We have a suprapyloric group of lymph node, we have the pancreatico uh, lenal group of node, and we have inferior gastric and suprapyloric group of node. The superior gastric node, so these are the superior gastric nodes, so they drain the limbs from the upper lesser curvature into the left gastric and the pericardial node. Next, we have the suprapyloric group of nodes. These are the suprapyloric group of nodes. So, they drain this antral segment, antral segment on the lesser curvature of the stomach into the right suprapancreatic node. So, next we have the pancreaticolenal group of nodes, these nodes. So, they drain lymph high on the greater curvature into the left gastroepiploic and splenic node. And lastly, we have the inferior gastric and subpyloric groups. This is that group that drains lymph along the right gastroepiploic vascular arcade or pedicle. So, this is the one supply. Besides, the, uh, all the four zones of uh, lymph nodes uh, drain into the celiac group and uh, ultimately into the thoracic duct. Although these lymph nodes drain different areas of stomach, gastric cancer may metastasize to any of the four nodal groups regardless of the cancer location. In addition to that, the extensive submucosal plexus of lymph node accounts for the fact that there is frequently macroscopic evidence of uh, malignant cells several centimeters away from the gross disease. So, this is also one of the major cause of spread that is the submucosal plexus of lymphatic. So, they account for the uh, mostly for the metastasis to distant areas. Coming to the innervations. So the stomach is uh, having two innervation. One is the extrinsic innervation, and another is the intrinsic innervation. So the extrinsic innervation of the stomach comprises parasympathetic supply and sympathetic supply. So the parasympathetic is via the vagus, and the sympathetic is uh, via the celiac plexus. The vagus nerve originates 
in the vagal nuclei and it has both afferent and uh, efferent fibers. So afferent fibers are basically sensory and uh, the efferent fibers uh, are basically secretory motor to the stomach. So the efferent fibers are involved in the relaxation of the stomach. They are involved in stimulation of gastric mortality and secretory function. The intrinsic innervation of the stomach exists principally in two types, myotic plexus of Orbeck and mucosal plexus of Meissner, as uh, it exists in other part of the gastrointestinal tract. Coming to the physiology of the stomach and the duodenum, the stomach mechanically breaks up the ingested food and together with the action of acid and pepsin it forms chyme that passes into the duodenum. So in contrast to the acidic uh, environment of the stomach, the duodenum is alkaline because of the secretion of the bicarbonate ion both from uh, the pancreas and uh, the duodenum. So the environment in stomach is acidic, on the other hand the environment in uh, duodenum is uh, alkaline. So this neutralizes the acid chyme and adjusts the osmolarity to approximately that of the plasma. The secretions of gastric juice mainly comprises uh, pepsin, intrinsic factors, ions and uh, other organic solutes in diluted uh, hydrochloric acid. Classically, three phases of uh, gastric secretions are described by Pavlov. First we have uh, cephalic phase, then we have the gastric phase and then we have intestinal phase. So coming to the cephalic phase, it is mediated by the vagal activity and it's secondary to sensory erosion. Gastric phase is the a response of food within the stomach and is mediated principally but not exclusively by uh, gastrin. In the intestinal phase, the presence of chyme in the duodenum and the small bowel inhibits gastric emptying. The acidification of the duodenum leads to production of secretin which also inhibits gastric acid secretion along with numerous other peptides originating from the gut. So important cells we have the gastric epithelial cells. So these are mucus producing cells which are present in the body, hylorus and duodenum. The specialized uh, parietal and sieve cells are found in the gastric rib. The stomach also contain endocrine cells. Coming to the parietal cells, parietal cells are found in the body of the stomach and are more abundant in the distal part. They are responsible for production of uh, hydrogen ions to form hydrochloric acid. The hydrogen ions are actively pumped by proton pump, hydrogen potassium ATPH, which exchanges the internal the intraluminal potassium or hydrogen ion. So potassium is exchanged with the hydrogen ion. The potassium ion enter the lumen of the grip passively and hydrogen ions are pumped out actively. Coming to the chief cells, so these cells lie proximally in the gastric grip. So it produces uh, pepsinogen, so pepsinogen 1 and pepsinogen 2. Pepsinogen 2, 1 is uh, produced in the stomach. Pepsinogen is uh, activated to produce pepsin, that is the active enzyme. The ratio between the pepsinogen 1 and 2 in this serum decreases with gastric atrophy, which is a precancerous condition. Next, we have the endocrine cells. The stomach 
contains endocrine cells richly which are critical to its function. So in the gastric antrum, the mucosa contains G cell which produces gas pain. During a meal, gastrin stimulates the stomach to release gastric acid. So this allows the stomach to break down protein swallowed as food and absorb certain vitamins. So the body of the stomach contains antrochromatin-like cell that is known as ECL cell and produces histamine, a key factor in gastric secretion. So there is a large number of somatostatin producing B cells also throughout the stomach, so which has a negative regulatory role. So this somatostatin is released in response to number of factors including acidification. So this uh, peptide that is the somatostatin it acts probably by suppressing the activity of the gastrin cell, ECL cells and parietal cells to inhibit acid production. So we have uh, uh, endocrine cells in the duodenum as well. It uh, produces uh, cholecystokinin and secretin. Cholecystokinin it stimulates the pancreas to produce trypsin and it also helps in contraction of the gallbladder. Secretin inhibits gastric acid secretion and promotes production of bicarbonate by the pancreas. So next important uh, thing is uh, gastric mucus and the gastric mucosal barrier. So the gastric mucus layer is essential to the integrity of the gastric mucosa. So it is a viscid layer of uh, mucopolysaccharides produced by the mucus producing cells of the stomach and the pyloric gland. The gastric mucus is an important barrier that protects the gastric mucosa from mechanical damage and also from the effect of acid and pepsin. It uh, considerably buffering capacity is enhanced by the presence of bicarbonate ion within the mucus. So many factors can lead to breakdown of these uh, gastric mucosal barriers so which includes bile, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that is NSAIDs, alcohol, trauma and shock. So these factors uh, may lead to breakdown of the gastric mucosal barrier. Next investigations in relation to stomach and uh, duodenum. So first we have flexible endoscopy. So this is the gold standard uh, investigation. It is more sensitive than conventional radiology in the assessment of majority of the gastroduodenal conditions like peptic ulceration, gastritis, or uh, duodenitis. In uh, upper gastrointestinal bleeding, endoscopy is far more superior to any other investigation. So this is an uh, endoscopic view which is uh, showing diffuse uh, gastritis in the body of the stoma. So here we can see coffee ground material secondary to bleeding and uh, multiple ulcerations. So these are the multiple ulceration here we can see fresh bleeding and these are the altered blood which is the which is giving coffee ground appearance. So this is the prepyloric ulcer with surrounding induration of the gastric mucosa. This is the pylorus and here this is the prepyloric area. So here we have the ulcer with induration. So here we can see large benign gastric ulcer in the greater curvature of the stomach. So this is the retroflex view which is obtained after doing the J maneuver during endoscopy. So here this is the scope. And from below on doing J maneuver, we can see the fundal part. So here we can see the fundal part it has gone beyond the uh, crura. So this is the uh, crura dilated area. 
so there is a crural defect and through that the fundus has gone into the uh, thoracic cavity so this is the uh, type 1 sliding hydrothernia so here we can see narrowing of the opening so this is uh, the pyloric stenosis and here we can see diffuse growth these are the growth these are the growth so diffuse gastric cancer of the distal end of the stomach so these are uh, some of the uh, views of different uh, pathologies so next we have the contrast radiology so upper gastrointestinal radiology that is barrier mill study is now less frequently used as endoscopy is a more sensitive investigation for most gastric problems Computerized tomography imaging with oral contrast has also replaced contrast radiology in areas where anatomical information is sought. That is the uh, larger hiatus hernia of uh, the rolling type or the chronic gastric valvulus or area beyond a growth where um, scope cannot be passed. So in those um, areas previously barium study was the choice but with the advent of CT scan and the oral contrast that information can be uh, gathered so next the important tool of investigation is ultrasonography so standard ultrasound imaging can be used to investigate the stomach but is uh, less sensitive than other modalities in contrast, endoluminal uh, ultrasound and laparoscopic ultrasound are probably the most sensitive technique available in the preoperative staging of gastric cancer. So, endoluminal and laparoscopic ultrasound are most important so far as the uh, sonography is concerned. In endoluminal ultrasound, the tran transducer is usually attached to the distal tip of the instrument. Five layers of the gastric wall may be identified on uh, endoluminal ultrasound and the depth of invasion of uh, a tumor can be assessed with accuracy of 90%. Larger lymph nodes can also be identified in around 80% of the cases. Finally, it may be possible to identify liver metastasis uh, not seen on XL. Uh, amazing and the laparoscopic ultrasound is also very sensitive so next we have um, uh, computerized tomography scanning and um, MRI or uh, CT with uh, PET scan that is positron emission tomography so positron emission tomography is uh, mainly used after a procedure is done mainly to the residual tumor and it is useful for carcinoma stomach then comes the laparoscopy that is a diagnostic laparoscopy so this technique is now well used in the assessment of patient with the gastric cancer in a particular value uh, in uh, detecting the peritoneal disease which is uh, which goes um, undetected on um, CT scan. So there it is of uh, use, and its main limitation is in evaluation of uh, posterior uh, extension. So anteriorly we can see, but uh, beyond that, posteriorly uh, we can't see anything. So that is the limitation of laparoscopy. So that is overcome by uh, the availability of CT scan or endoluminal uh, ultrasonography. So next uh, modality of investigation we have um, uh, angiography. So angiography is used most commonly in the investigation of uh, upper gastrointestinal bleeding that is not uh, identified uh, using uh, endoscopy. So here the main bleeding vessel is um, identified and therapeutic embolization may be uh, performed 
and uh, bleeding is uh, usually arrested in uh, patient where surgery is difficult or inadvisable. So the main uh, vessel is um, identified. So an embolization is done. So embolization is a, a procedure in which a piece of special uh, gelatin uh, sponges or other materials are injected to the blood vessels to clog it. So or upon clogging, so the uh, bleeding stops. So that is the process of embolization. So therapeutic embolization can be uh, performed following angiography. So now we'll um, start with the topic of gastritis. So there are many types of gastritis. So we'll start with type A gastritis. So type A gastritis is a autoimmune condition in which uh, there are circulating antibodies to the parietal cells. So here antrum is not affected. So the body fundus is mostly affected here. So the parietal cell produce gastric acid in response to histamine, acetylcholine and gastrin via H2 receptor, M3 receptor or gastrin receptor respectively. The parietal cells contain an extensive secretory network which is called canaliculi from which the ACL is secreted by active transport into the uh, stomach. So this results in uh, atrophy of the parietal cell mass, resulting in hypochlorhydria and ultimately a chlorhydria. And as uh, intrinsic factor is also produced by the parietal cell, there is uh, a malabsorption of uh, vitamin B12 which, uh, if uh, untreated, may result in pernicious uh, anemia. In type A gastritis, the antrum is uh, not affected and the hypochlorhydria leads to production of a high level of gastrin from the antral G cells. So that results in chronic hypergastrinemia. Over time, it is uh, apparent that uh, microadenomas develop in the ECL cells of the stomach, sometimes uh, becoming identifiable uh, tumor nodules. So we find small tumor nodules. Uh, so very rarely these tumors can uh, become malignant. So a patient with type uh, A gastritis are predisposed to develop gastric cancer and that is why screening of uh, such uh, patient endoscopically may be appropriate. So we have to do frequent uh, monitoring uh, endoscopically if uh, uh, we encounter person suffering from type A gastritis. So next we have is a type B gastritis. So it is associated uh, with the helicobacter pylori uh, infection. So it affects the antrum and these patients are prone to have a peptic ulcer disease. So a helicobacter associated pangastritis is also a very common manifestation of infection and patients with pangastritis are most prone to develop gastric cancer. Next we have reflux esophagitis. So reflux esophagitis is caused by enterogastric reflux and is particularly common after uh, gastric surgery. Although commonly seen after gastric surgery, it is occasionally found in patients with no previous surgical intervention or who had a, a cholecystectomy. So here, bile chelating or prokinetic agents may be useful in the treatment and as a temporary measure to avoid the consideration of revisional surgery. So we should uh, try with the uh, procryonetic or bilchelating agent first before going for any revision surgery in a reflux gastritis following any surgical procedure. So operation for this condition should be reserved for most uh, severe cases. So next we have uh, uh, erosive gastritis. 
it is caused by agents that disturb the gastric mucosal barrier and NSAIDs and alcohol are most common cause of uh, uh, damaging the gastric uh, mucosal barrier and it causes erosive gastritis. The NSAID induced uh, gastric lesions are associated with inhibition of uh, COX-1 enzyme hence reducing the production of a cytoprotective prostaglandin in the stomach. Few NSAIDs are mediated uh, by COX-2 and the use of a specific COX-2 inhibitor reduces the incidence uh, of uh, uh, the side effect, basically the gastritis. However, long-term use of COX-2 inhibitor is associated with uh, appearance of cardiovascular complications. So that is to be kept in mind while using COX-2 inhibitor for uh, longer duration. Next we have stress gastritis. So it's a common sequelae of serious illness or injury and is characterized by reduction in the blood supply to uh, superficial mucosa of the uh, stomach. So although common, it is not usually recognized unless stress ulceration and bleeding supervene, in which case uh, treatment can be extremely difficult. Prevention of the stress bleeding from the stomach is much easier than treating it. The routine use of uh, H2 receptor antagonist with or without barrier agent such as sucralfate in patients who are in intensive care is advocated. So these measures have been shown to reduce the incidence of bleeding from stress ulceration. So prevention is uh, better. So beforehand we have to use the H2 receptor uh, antagonists or uh, ba uh, barrier agents like uh, sucralfate in patients who need intensive care. So next we have the Minitears uh, disease. So this is um, an unusual uh, condition characterized by gross uh, hypertrophy of the gastric mucosal fold, mucus production and hypochlorhydrate. And this is a pre-malignant condition and may present with hypoproteinemia and uh, anemia. The disease seems to be caused by overexpression of a transforming growth factor alpha that is TGF alpha and there is no treatment other than uh, gastrectomy. So if we encounter this um, problem so the treatment is the surgery that is uh, gastrectomy. So next type of um, gastritis is uh, lymphocytic uh, gastritis. So this type of uh, gastritis is uh, rarely seen. It is uh, characterized by the infiltration of uh, the gastric mucosa by the T cells and uh, is probably associated with the H. pylori uh, infection. The pattern of uh, in infection resembles that is seen in celiac uh, disease or uh, lymphocytic uh, uh, colitis. So in other forms of gastritis, we have eosinophilic gastritis, we have granulomatous gastritis, we have AIDS gastritis, we have phlegmonous gastritis. So regarding eosinophilic gastritis, it appears to have an allergic basis and is uh, treated usually with steroids uh, and uh, chromoglycate. Uh, regarding granulomatous gastritis, it is seen rarely in uh, Crohn's disease and may also be associated with tuberculosis. Um, AIDS gastritis is uh, secondary to infection with uh, cryptosporidium and uh, regarding phlegmonous gastritis it is a rare bacterial infection of the stomach found in patient with uh, severe illness. So this is about uh, the various types of gastritis. So next we have peptic ulcers. The common site for peptic ulcers 
are the first part of the duodenum and the lesser curvature of the stomach but they also occur on the stoma following gastric surgery or the esophagus or in the Michael's diverticulum which contains the ectopic gastric epithelium. So besides first part of the duodenum and the lesser curvature of the stomach, it can occur in the Michael's diverticulum or in the esophagus or stoma following gastric surgery. So in general, the ulcer either occurs at a junction between different types of epithelium or in the epithelium with least resistance to acid damage. Patient with uh, gastric ulceration have relatively normal level of gastric acid uh, secretion. And as peptic ulceration will uh, occur in the presence of a very high uh, acid level such as those found in the patient with uh, gastrinoma or Jolinger ellison syndrome and as all ulcers can be healed in the absence of acid it is clear that acid is an important factor for causation of peptic ulceration so it is now widely accepted that infection with h pylori is the most important factor in the development of peptic ulceration the other factors of major importance at present is ingestion of uh, and said cigarette smoking predisposes to peptic ulceration and increases the relapse rate after treatment with uh, gastric anti-secretory agents or following elective surgery so duodenal ulceration coming to the incidence of duodenal ulceration there have been marked changes in the last two decades in the demography of the patients presenting with uh, duodenal ulceration and with the widespread use of uh, gastric anti-secretory agent and eradication therapy for the patient with dys dyspepsia the incidence of duodenal ulceration and frequency of elective surgery uh, for duodenal ulceration and complication is declining Coming to the pathology of a duodenal um, ulcer, the most duodenal ulcers, ulcers occur in the first part of the duodenum. The, uh, the chronic ulcer penetrates the mucosa and into the muscle coat leading to fibrosis. The fibrosis causes deformities such as pyloric stenosis. When an ulcer heals, the scar can be observed in the mucosa. Sometimes there may be more than one duodenal ulcer. In situation uh, in which there is both a posterior and anterior duodenal ulcer, uh, that is known as the kissing ulcer. So anteriorly placed uh, ulcers tend to perforate, and in contrast, posterior duodenal ulcer tends to bleed sometimes by eroding a large vessel such as gastroduodenal artery so occasionally the ulceration may be so extensive that the entire duodenal cap is uh, ulcerated and devoid of uh, uh, mucosa with respect to the giant uh, duodenal ulcer that is more than 2 cm, malignancy in this region is so uncommon that uh, in normal circumstances, surgeons can be confident that uh, they are dealing with benign disease. Even though from external uh, palpitation, it may not uh, appear so. But in stomach, the situation is uh, different. Histopathology. So, microscopically, the destruction of the muscular coat is observed and the base of the ulcer is covered with the granulation tissue. With the arteries uh, in this region shows the typical changes of end arthritis obliterate. Sometimes the termination of uh, nerves can be seen uh, along the fibrosis. 
coming to the clinical uh, features in india ratio of a duodenal ulcer to gastric ulcer is 30 is to 1 and uh, it's common in males it is uh, common in all socioeconomic groups more with stress professionals that is thai with the type a personality so here patient will have pain pain is uh, more before food especially in early in the morning and uh, decreases after taking food it is classically called as hunger pain as it is relieved uh, by taking food so night pain here are uh, common next we have the periodicity so periodicity is uh, more common than in chronic gastric ulcer with seasonal variation so uh, it comes and again disappears again it come back so that is the periodicity then uh, patient can have water brass or that is excessive salivation heartburn or vomiting patient can have melina so it, they can have hematemesis as well and here appetite is good and uh, patient often gain weight chronic duodenal ulcers can be uncomplicated or complicated so complications of uh, duodenal ulcer are pyloric stenosis which occurs uh, due to scarring or cicatrization of the first part of the duodenum and uh, next complication is bleeding which occurs in about 10 percent of the cases of uh, duodenal ulcer coming to the investigation of a duodenal ulcer so barium meal x-ray uh, was done previously which usually shows deformed or uh, absence of duodenal cap because of spasm but now the investigation of choice is uh, endoscopy or gastroscopy so that reveals the type location of ulcer and narrowing if uh, any and besides that biopsy can be taken uh, along with the inspection and biopsy is uh, taken to look for the presence of uh, helicobacter pylori usually biopsies are taken from the duodenum pylorus antrum body fundus and uh, infection is uh, confirmed by rapid urease test or c13 or 14 breath uh, Coming to the differential diagnosis, it can be carcinoma stomach, especially involved when it involves the pylorus, or dyspepsia due to other causes like hiatus hernia, esophagitis, polycystitis, and uh, chronic pancreatitis. So these are the differential diagnoses. Regarding treatment, the aim of uh, treatment is to relieve symptoms, to heal ulcer, to prevent recurrence. So general measures are advised, like avoid uh, alcohol and safe smoking spicy food, and we must advise patient to have a frequent uh, small uh, meal. In specific measures, the intragastric pH should be maintained above five by using various medications like. Um, uh, PPI or H2 blockers or uh, uh, sucralofit. So we have drugs like um, H2 blockers. So they promote ulcer healing in four to eight weeks by uh, reducing acid secretion. So agents like uh, cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine are available. So these can be used and regarding proton pump inhibitors of ppi it inhibits the parietal cell hydrogen potassium atp enzyme responsible for uh, acid secretion they are used for 6 to 12 weeks they stop acid secretion completely so agents which are available are omeprazole esmoprazole lensoprazole 
iloprazole, pantoprazole or rebiprazole. So, these um, drugs can be uh, used as well. Then we have the antacid. So, antacid neutralizes the HCl to form water and salt and also inhibit uh, peptic uh, activity. So, we have um, uh, aluminum hydroxide and uh, magnesium tricilicate which are commonly used and uh, the dose is 2 gram 2 hourly basis after uh, food. Then we have another agent that is sucralfate. It is an uh, aluminum salt of uh, sulfated suc sucrose which provides a protective coat to ulcer crater thereby promoting healing. So it covers the ulcer crater and thereby promote healing. So it uh, inhibits peptic activity. So it binds to the ulcer bed and stays for 12 hours. It prevents the back diffusion of a hydrogen ion, raises um, androgenous prostaglandin level in the tissue, thereby preventing colonization of bacteria in the gastric mucosa. So usual dose is 1 gram QID before meals for 6 weeks. So next we have the anti-H pylori regime, it's very useful and is given for 14 days. So we have, um, this is followed by PPI. So we have many combinations like amoxicillin, clarithromycin, omeprazole or amoxicillin, metronidazole, omeprazole or amoxicillin, metronidazole and uh, colloid bismuth. So these are the following regimes which are available. So we usually give it for 14 days and it is to be followed by uh, PPI. So when medicine fails, there comes the role of surgery. So if the patient has uh, already received adequate medical therapy and the ulcer is uh, there for long duration, then surgery is indicated. In H. pylori positive cases, if anti-H. pylori treatment for 12 weeks followed by PPI for 6 weeks fails, then surgery is to be contemplated. <coughs> Excuse me. Surgery for uh, uncomplicated uh, duodenal ulcer. The incidence of surgery for uncomplicated peptic ulcer has fallen markedly with the use of medication. But uh, then also the procedures which are available uh, are highly selective vagotomy, selective vagotomy with uh, pyloroplasty, truncal vagotomy with uh, gastroderenostomy or uh, pyloroplasty, posterior truncal vagotomy with uh, anterior ceromyotomy or vagotomy with uh, antractomy. So these are the procedures which are available for uncomplicated uh, duodenal ulcers. As the patient have uh, uncomplicated peptic ulceration, the idea of operation is to reduce the gastric acid secretion. So, highly selective vagotomy will be the appropriate. So, highly selective uh, vagotomy, here the parietal cell mass of the stomach get uh, denervated. This is the most satisfactory operation for duodenal ulceration with a low incidence of side effect and acceptable recurrence rate. Only problem with the highly selective vagotomy is that it is a highly technical. The vagal branches from anterior and the posterior vagus to the lower 7 cm of esophagus, fundus and body of the stomach are divided, keeping the nerve of latter jet intact which supplies the antrum. So, nerve of latter jet is the terminal uh, branch of the anterior uh, vagal trunk. So, that is uh, to be kept intact and that supplies the antrum. So, this is uh, uh, the diagram which is showing uh, highly selective vagotomy. So, this is the anterior branch, behind we have the posterior branch. So anterior, this is the anterior trunk which is uh, giving branches. So here what we do is we divide these branches and keeping the terminal branch, so this is the nerve of 
letter there. So we keep it intact so that the this part is denervated and this part is having the innervation. So here this part is devoid of uh, nerve supply so the acid production will reduce. On the other hand here the um, innervation is there so uh, the motor activity will be uh, intact so far as the pylorus is concerned and uh, so mostly drainage procedure is not required in highly selective vagotomy because of uh, preservation of this uh, nerve of lateral jet which supplies the antrum. The main advantage of uh, highly selective vagotomy is that a drainage procedure is not required as I have already said because the nerve supply to the pylorus is intact and this helps in propulsion of bolus of uh, food from stomach to uh, duodenum. So only problem with highly selective uh, vagotomy is it is technically difficult and the recurrence is uh, 2 to 10 percent and is a little higher as compared to truncal vagotomy and gastrojejunostomy which is around 2 to 7 percent. And uh, person uh, often complain slight epigastric uh, fullness for a uh, few initial week following the procedure. Next procedure of choice is uh, truncal vagotomy and gastrojejunostomy. This is uh, usually preferred by most of the surgeons. The principle of uh, the operation is that a section of the vagal nerve which are critically involved in the secretion of the gastric acid reduces the maximum maximal acid out output by approximately 50 percent. So because the vagus nerves are conductor of motor impulse to the stomach, denervation of the anteropyloro duodenal segment result in gastric stasis. So in order to prevent this gastric uh, stasis, a drainage procedure is uh, required. Otherwise, if drainage procedure is uh, not done, then there will be gastric uh, retention. So this is the uh, surgery. So here this is the anterior trunk and here this is the posterior trunk. So the these two trunks, the, anterior and the posterior or that is the right and the left vagus and nerves are uh, transacted and uh, this leads to denervation of the uh, nerve supply of the entire stomach including the antrum. So as vagus is the secret motor to the stomach so the drainage procedure is uh, required uh, along with uh, uh, vagotomy that is trunkal vagotomy. So the most popular drainage procedure was the Henneke's Mikulis pyloplasty. So it was uh, simple to perform and involved the longitudinal section of uh, pyloric ring. The incision was closed transversely. So gastrojejunostomy is an uh, alternative drainage procedure to pyloroplasty. This is performed by opening the lesser sac and uh, an anastomosis between the most dependent part of the antrum and the first jejunal loop is created. An isoperistaltic anastomosis is most commonly performed. So the truncal vagotomy and drainage is uh, substantially safer than gastrectomy. So next uh, topic we have the gastric ulceration. Coming to the incidence as uh, with the uh, duodenal ulceration, each pylori and NSAIDs are the important etiological factor in gastric ulceration. So gastric ulceration is also associated with smoking and other factors are of less importance. Gastric ulceration is substantially less common than duodenal uh, ulceration. The incidence of gastric ulcers is, is equal between the sexes 
and the population with uh, gastric ulcers tend to be older. The more prevalent in low socio-economic group. Coming to the pathology, the pathology of the gastric ulcer is similar to that of the duodenal ulcer, except that duodenal ulcers tend to be larger as compared to uh, duodenal ulcer. So fibrosis, when it occurs, may result in the now rarely seen hourglass contraction of the stomach. Large chronic gastric ulcers may erode posteriorly into the pancreas and on other occasions into major vessels such as the spanning artery. Less commonly, they may erode into other organs such as the transverse colon. Chronic gastric ulcers are much more common on the lesser curvature, especially at the incisura angularis, than on the greater curvature. And even when high on the lesser curvature, they tend to be at the boundary between the acid secreting and the non acid secreting epithelia. So, with atrophy of the parietal uh, cell mass, non acid secreting epithelium migrates up in the lesser curvature. So, malignancy in gastric ulcers. So, gastric ulcers are associated with malignancy, whereas uh, chronic duodenal ulcers are not associated with malignancy. So it is fundamental that any gastric ulcer should be regarded as being malignant no matter how classically it uh, resembles as a benign gastric ulcer. So multiple biopsies should uh, always be taken perhaps as many as 10 well targeted biopsies before an ulcer can be tentatively accepted as being benign. So, modern antisecretory agents can frequently heal the ulceration associated with gastric cancer but are ineffective in treating the malignancy. So, beforehand, we have to diagnose. Further biopsies are to be taken when ulcers are healing and when healed. At operation, even experienced surgeons may have difficulty in distinguishing gastric cancer with benign ulcer. The operative strategies differ so radically that uh, it is essential, if at all possible, that is, uh, confident diagnosis is uh, made before operation. Petical hemorrhages found on the serosa of the patient with peptic ulceration are a useful sign but uh, not entirely reliable. So beforehand we have to uh, establish the diagnosis. Coming to the clinical features, so it is equal in both sexes and it is uh, more in uh, females. Uh, common after uh, the age of 40 years. Pain occurs and pain is in the epigastric region after taking food and it lasts for up to two hours and it is relieved by vomiting or inducing vomiting. So here in uh, gastric uh, ulcer, the food aggravate, uh, the pain aggravates on taking food. On the other hand, in duodenal ulcer, pain get relieved on taking food. So that is the main difference. So here regarding periodicity, so the symptom free interval may be of two to six months. So periodicity is there as well. Patient can uh, have vomiting. So vomiting relieves pain and is often induced by uh, patient uh, to relieve pain. Patient may have hematomasis and melina here appetite is good, but there is uh, hesitation. So hesitancy to eat is always there as it uh, uh, aggravates 
pain. So it further leads to weight loss. And on deep palpation, tenderness is elicited in the epigastric region. So investigation, we have uh, barium meal, which was the investigation of choice uh, previously. And but nowadays, the uh, gastroscopy or endoscopy is preferred to see the location of ulcer, type of ulcer, and uh, side by side uh, biopsies are to be taken to confirm the diagnosis whether this is a benign ulcer or a malignant one. So gastroscopy is the investigation of choice and uh, sonography of the abdomen is done to exclude other diseases. So here treatment is uh, almost the same so far as medical management is concerned. So the H2 blockers, PPR, sucralfate uh, may be helpful in eliminating the symptom. Asymptomatic ulcer do exist and may turn into malignancy. So surgery is uh, preferred when uh, uh, malignancy occurs. So partial gastrectomy with uh, Bildot 1 gastroduodenal anastomosis or Bildot 2 anastomosis are done. So regarding complication, so complication one can have perforation, one can have uh, hourglass contracture. So here the stomach is divided into two compartments due to cicatrization uh, in the lesser uh, curvature ulcer. So the, in our glass contracture, the stomach is divided into two compartments. Or there can be teapot deformities as well, that is shortening of the uh, lesser curvature due to cicatrization will lead to teapot deformities. Then one can have bleeding, that is bleeding especially from the erosion of the left gastric and rarely from the splenic uh, vessels. So splenic vessels lie posteriorly to the stomach. And uh, one can have penetration of this ulcer right into the uh, pancreas posteriorly or anteriorly into the liver, or there can uh, be malignant uh, transformation as well, usually um, as adenocarcinoma of the stomach in two to five percent of the cases. So other. Uh, Peptic ulcers. We have uh, a pre pyloric gastric ulcer, pyloric canal ulcer. So, pre pyloric uh, gastric ulcers was difficult to treat in the past, a problem that has been overcome with the introduction of uh, proton pump inhibitors. And regarding pyloric canal, um, ulcers are similar to the duodenal uh, ulcers. Here also, PPI plays an important uh, role in the treatment. So in both pre-pyloric and pyloric ulcers, uh, biopsy is uh, essential as it may be a uh, malignant one. So biopsy is essential in uh, pre-pyloric or pyloric ulcers. Regarding stromal ulcers, stromal ulcers occur after a gastroenterostomy or a gastrectomy of uh, the Bildo 2 type, the ulcer is uh, usually found on the jejunal side of the stoma.